All right, so let's finish up optical fibers. So the, some of the last things I want to talk about include things such as fiber amplifiers. And so, again, if you're going really long distances, like under the ocean, you're going to need to amplify the signal and regenerate it somehow. So one way to do that is you bring your signal in, you have a detector, you have some electronic circuitry, which would then drive a laser, and then you get your signal out. But you're not going to do this under the ocean. Why is that? Well, the problem is, is that optical fibers are awesome because data moves at the speed of light. However, we know that electronics is not the speed of light. And so this would slow down communication substantially every time you got to take it from the optical regime, do some electronics and get it back there. You're have inducing a delay. So it would be great if we could basically find a way to amplify where light does not tra stop traveling at the speed of light. Could we do that? Well, you can. You need a fiber amplifier, which is like a laser with no mirrors. Meaning that you get ready for the point of stimulated emission. Here comes your laser, your, your signal in. It goes through a special amplifying fiber, and then the signal comes out amplified. And so how this works is, well, if you took semiconductor courses with me, we had stimulated emission for photons and a semiconductor laser, or electron hole pair. So here comes in my photon and it produces a second photon of the same phase and direction as the first, and so I've got an amplification of two. In these, you've got something called erbium, which is a rare earth element you put into the glass. You pump it with a laser that's a different wavelength to excite it, so the erbium atoms are all excited. And what they do is they'll do the same thing, whereas photons come in, they can use the erbium to create additional photons, take the energy from the erbium and amplify out. And so the stimulated emission at 1.5 micron, these are the atomic energy levels in erbium here. And so typically you pump it with 980 nanometer light, that's the pump laser, feed it in there. That excites the erbium electrons to higher orbits of the erbium. Then you get it to, it relaxes down here. This is the level that is you want to amplify it, right at 1.5 microns. Your photon comes in. It causes the erbium atom to relax. It gives that energy up to create a second photon, and now you've amplified by a factor of two. And of course, these amplifiers can amplify hundreds or thousands or more in terms of the number of photons that are how much amplification you get. Here's an erbium dope fiber amplifier you can see here. It's all lit up, powered up, and if you bring an optical signal in here, it'll come, in mu come out much stronger on the other end. And it's, it's glowing because of all the pump power going into it. Okay. So, um, very simple, and the advantage is, is that the signal goes through here at the speed of light and is amplified without any delay. They do have a filter here, which is to basically get rid of all this pump laser, because we don't want the pump laser going on. This basically only lets the right signal out, and it gets rid of these other wavelengths, which could em emit as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about silicon photonics and, and some of the ways we modulate using silicon and other materials. And so silicon photonics, Intel and other companies are pushing this because basically bring the speed of light functionality onto silicon chips. How powerful could that be? And so they're working on creating light sources on silicon, how you guide light, how you modulate it into ones and zeros. Here's a laser beam, chop it up into ones and zeros. How you make detectors, how you do low cost assembly and integration, and how you add intelligence such as CMOS to it. So in terms of making waveguides, you don't use optical fibers. Um, it, it's, it's too difficult uh, to, to, you know, to kind of, you know, imagine the bee's nest of fibers if you put that on a chip and you tried to glue them all in space with LEDs and detectors. You'd never be able to do it, right? And so instead, in the actual silicon, you could try to make ridge or strip or strip loaded waveguides where these basically give you higher refractive index regions which confine the light. Now, you're like, silicon is a dark material. How does it work? Well, at 1.5 microns, silicon is transparent because the photons at 1.5 microns do not have as much energy as the band gap of silicon, so they cannot be absorbed. So even though silicon looks opaque in the visible, it's actually transparent in the infrared and at 1.5 microns. But you can't use waveguides because if I have a waveguide and I try to bend it like this and I send a photon of light down there, if I'm not at the critical angle, then the problem is is that it's going to refract out and it's going to lose instead of being guided along the optical fiber. So I'm limited for the bend radius and if I'm doing an optical circuit that's a problem because I need to get very high density. I don't have time to have a nice long gradual turn. It takes up too much space. Rather instead I need to be able to have some way 
over a very small distance versus a very large area to take that light and have it turn 90 degrees or whatever I want to do with it, just like you could do with a wire. And so what they do is they use interference, they use photonic crystal wave guns. We talked about photonic crystals when we talked about interference. And they basically are ways where you put high and low refractive index, period, periodic, just like we did when we made anti-reflection coatings and perfect reflectors and things like that. And that basically using interference commands the light where it has to go. So here's an example where they put holes in the silicon and the light will go boom, boom like this. Over very short distances you can guide and make the light do things it would never do using interference principles. Check this out. This is interference used to make an optical fiber with really low dispersion. This is air. These are holes, which is mainly air, and they use this to create quantum confinement to create a core that is confined not using refractive index but using interference principles. And the advantage is, is that if this is mainly air and this is mainly air, then your optical dispersion is much less than it would be if they had two different types of glass. So that's a way to use it. It's called a photonic crystal optical fiber. Very expensive to make, though, but you, these are, I think they, some of these are commercially available at this point. So you can imagine how they make these. You take a bunch of glass tubes, pack them together, and you do that same thing where you draw it down in a fiber tower, and you end up getting um, them to shrink down to the sizes you need. But not an easy process. And if you have these waveguides, you can do some interesting things. So this is a, a directional coupler here. These are all the different types of things you can do with these waveguides on a, on a substrate. Directional coupler means I could send light this down this one, but I could see it couple over to here because these are so close to each other. And so you could see, here's a simple way to show this. This is a waveguide high refractive index, waveguide high refractive index are right next to each other. Send light down this one. Notice how the E field here penetrates enough over into the other waveguide such that as it keeps going down the light starts to couple over into the other waveguide. In fact, at a certain distance, if you have the right distance, it will couple 100% over to the other side. Almost like magic. So the key is to get the distance set right and the separation set such that it will couple over perfectly or you could split it this way. You could have 50% if you do it only half, you know, a shorter distance. And of course, if you let it keep going longer, it would transfer back to the other one. So it kind of oscillates back and forth between the two waveguides. Here's a microwave coupler. They basically take metal lines, they put a microwave signal, and you could see it coupling over to the other transmission line. If you look at the PowerPoint version, you'll see a nice video animation of this, of these things, and showing the waves propagating and coupling over. So you can do the same thing with microwaves as well, which makes sense. You're used to basically electrical wires having interference with them because of the resistance and capacitance. So this is kind of like the optical equivalent of that. So I'm going to go next start looking at the Max Zender thing. What is this thing here? Why would we split light and recombine it on the other side? So let's look at what that is. So how are we going to basically create a stream of optical ones and zeros. At this point, we've just assumed that magically, somehow onto a laser, you create, you know, a bit stream of laser pulses where this is zero laser power and this would be maximum laser power here corresponding to zeros and ones, right? Well, one way to do that is you could try to turn the laser on and off really fast. But because of electrical capacitance and other delays, you really can't, typically can't switch the laser as fast as you want. And so there's a more elegant way to do that. And instead, you use this waveguide we saw on the previous slide where it splits the light into two channels and it recombines it on this side. And this is called a Max Zender waveguide interferometer, and it's a great way to modulate the optical signal. And so, again, I split the light 50% onto each way, each arm of this, and it comes, here's my inputting light, and here's my modulated output signal. And so if I looked at this, my input signal would be, you know, a constant you know, intensity of light coming in. On this end, I would then see it chopped up into ones and zeros coming out this way. And to do this, you notice I put a voltage supply and two electrodes on either side of this material. So how does this work? Well, you're going to have to do a calculation using one type of material um, in the, the lab this week. But one way you can do this is there are glasses where when you put a voltage across that, the electric field changes the refractive index of the material. So, if I put no voltage on this, then I would expect that the photons that are coming down this arm and the photons that are coming down this arm 
come into the point where they're in the exact same phase. So I would see the same input power here turn into output power here. Okay, so I'd split my original E field amplitude into each arms and halves, and when it gets back to this side, they're in, in phase, and I get the same E field amplitude out. But if I wanted to create an optical zero, I put a voltage on here, change the refractive index such that there's a phase difference between the two arms. They're 90 degrees out of phase when they recombine here, and I'd see an optical zero as a result. I could use this to increase or decrease refractive index. Key point is I need to shift the phases by 90 degrees or 180 degrees to get them out of phase. And the beauty of this is that this can be mod this material can be modulated much more quickly typically than you can by turning a, a laser or an LED on and off. And so this is a very fast way to do it just by feeding the laser into the waveguide then it goes into the optical fiber from there. So that's it for optical fibers. Uh, this is a substantial lecture because it's a two-week lab, but uh, you've learned a lot. Hopefully you learned enough that if you ever go into optical fibers, now you know some of the basics. Again, try to answer these questions. In this one, you have to do a little Google searching, but it's important because the fastest fibers are done using this WDM technique. And so it's important, I think, that you look that up and understand that as well.